You don't know who I am and what I'm about. But I'll do anything to find that source. Listen to my voice. Am I lying? <laughs> Matson Tomlin, who's the writer of the upcoming film on Netflix called Project Power, and we're very excited about this. But, Matson, you've got all kinds of projects in the pipeline, too. So this is just the beginning of your <laughs> I hope uh, sci-fi and comic book related <laughs> career in, in yeah. entertainment. So I'm excited you came come to talk to us today. Thank you for having me. Super psyched. Now, in a lot of superhero stories, uh, people are either celebrating or trying to shut down or control powered individuals, but Project Power kind of takes a more chaotic approach, which I really love. What can you tease about that aspect of the introduction of these pills that can give anyone, well, almost, almost anyone, <laughs> five minutes of superpowers? Yeah, I, I, a big part of the original idea was, you know, exploring would you take this pill? You know, this, this idea of, you know, you don't know what's going to happen to you. And, you know, there's, there's something scary. You could wind up with a good power. You could wind up with flying or being invincible, but you could also wind up with it kills you. And, and uh, there's, there's a great metaphor to that for, for, for things in life. And, you know, for, for me, it was kind of like, you know, the, the, the democratization of that and this idea that you know anybody can take this pill anybody can use it and what they do with it is up to them but you know it, the, the the film has this overarching metaphor of power you know the pill is called power and then there's lots of discussion throughout the movie of you know who has the actual you know thematic power here you know is it this organization that has created the, the pill is it the people who are taking it and uh, it was just is thematically so ripe and rich. And so for, for, for me, just writing the film, I really wanted to do something that played more with genre and, you know, wasn't so much a superhero movie as much as a superpower movie. And a, a, a big early reference when I first started writing the script was, was Eight Mile. And just kind of, I had this idea of what if Eight Mile had superpowers? In it like that that was, honestly was a big part of my way in was just thinking about like this young rapper who also like superpowers are going on in this world and that it just seemed like a fun fun movie that i wanted to see now the superhuman abilities that you put on display in project power aren't actually superhuman at all they actually come from the animal kingdom what are some of the cool powers that you discovered in the natural world during your research for the film there, you know, so there's there's a scene that, that you see in the trailer, so it's not giving away too much of, um, you know, this this guy who is uh, invisible. And, you know, the, the reason that he looks the way that he is is that it's not true invisibility, it's more camo. And we discovered these these really cool sea creatures. You know, there's a, there's a number of them, like there's an octopus that does this, but there's some other fish that do it that that can really truly become completely invisible to the naked eye because they can just take on the texture and kind of the shape of what's ever around them in this way that you look at it and you're convinced that like Jim Cameron has gotten in there and like Weta has made it and then you realize wait this stuff is real there's a um there's a power that that Hopefully, you know, if they if they do a sequel, I really want to get this in the sequel because I just think that it's so like cool and gross. But there are these lizards, there, there's lizards and frogs that uh, they're frogs that will literally just kind of vomit and their vomit will be <laughs> acid and it will just like let them get out of certain binds. And then there are these these lizards that uh, they have this defense mechanism of if they get scared, their eyes squirt blood at you. 
And it's just like like the body horror of it too. And, and, and the movie has a little bit of that Cronenbergian body horror to it where it was kind of like, wow, there are bits of the animal kingdom that are so gnarly and so brutal. You know, there are, you know, animals that will snap their own bones to get out of a, get out of a bind. And so taking all of those things and going, oh, there's a way to transpose that into action scenes. There's a way to transpose that into something else. It just seemed so cool and a, and a way to kind of ground it in something that you could point to and go, no, that's real. Now, interestingly, you chose to have multiple protagonists in Project Power, two of whom are different sides of the same coin, somewhat in uh, Jamie Foxx and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. What can you tease about these two characters that will entice fans of these great actors? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think number one, it you know, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Jamie Foxx, like it's a murderer's row of just awesome <laughs> yeah. actors. Like it's just seeing the two of them in this movie together, that's funny because I, I was writing with with kind of them in mind. You never you never want to write too much with actors in mind because you get your heart broken, but but certainly Jamie was 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 in my heart. And then I, I remember seeing the camera test when they were finally in their their wardrobe and, and makeup and going, oh, there they are, they're alive right now. So just purely the actors and watching them do their thing. In terms of the characters, you know, I, I think that um, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, Frank, he is a, uh, he's a police officer for the New Orleans Police Department. And he finds himself, you know, in, in some ways he's kind of what what we want cops to be, you know, the best version of them, which is somebody who's very concerned for their city and, you know, sees injustice going on and wants to do something about it. But it's also, you know, he does bad stuff in the movie. You know, it's like he is a power user, like he takes the pill and he does that in service of what his mission is, but that's also fully breaking what a cop is supposed to do. And so I, I think that, you know, given the political sphere right now, like there, there are interesting aspects to just coptom and you know the the power that the police have that I think that the movie gets into a little bit. And then for for Jamie's character, you know, he just has a very haunted backstory, and the reason that he is on this mission is is full of surprises, the history about it, and then also. Here, here's here's the thing that I can really say about the character. Um, you know, when when we were working with uh, our, our our stunt coordinator, uh, he he was talking about all of his his military friends that that he came up with, and he he had this term that that is pretty common in the military of situational awareness. And situ, you know, somebody who has a high SA, they can use what's around them. Uh, to win. And so it's it's kind of like we've seen it a little bit in the Jason Bourne movies where like kind of everything becomes a weapon. And it's not just the weaponization, but also, you know, really using the environment around you. And so Jamie's character art, his his situational awareness is so high that there are just some sequences where it really seems like he's in a bind and then he does something and just figures something out with just, you know, whatever is within reach of him that really makes you go, oh, I can't wait to see what he's going to do next. Mm -hmm. uh, arguably, the third protagonist is Robin, played by Dominique Fishback, and she feels very powerless, but the process of her finding her power, which is not what you might think, is very important to the story. Um, can you talk a little bit about adding that layer of depth to the narrative? Because you mentioned the rap skills. Are those things that are unique to Robin or, or does Dominique get in on that action as well? Yeah, Do Dominique's a, a, a wonder. You know, she, she, she does some rap. She also does performance art. She does beat poetry. She has these one woman shows. Like she, she you know, she calls herself the heroine of a thousand faces. And, and it, it's, it's so true to her. You know, she has this whole, you know, there's, there's the, the Hollywood side of her. But then also she really is a true artist and a true poet. And I, I feel so lucky that she became Robin. Um, that character was the start of the movie. You know, when I when I first started writing the script, it, it wasn't the military guy and it wasn't the cop. It was this girl. And it was it was very important to me, you know, my process when I 
when I write a spec, when I'm coming up with an original idea is I have the idea. And then the, the first thing I do is I go to Netflix or I go to HBO or I go to whatever platform and I look for that movie. I literally look to go see if that movie exists because if it exists, I don't have to write it. I can just watch it and be entertained and then it's all over. And, and what I found is that there were very, very few, alarmingly few, big, fun action movies that had a young black woman at the center of them. It, it, it's almost non-existent. And I, I felt like you know, that has to change. And part of the way that that changes is just by people doing it. And so she was always the heart and soul of the movie. She was always the person that I wanted to see this world through her eyes and go on this journey with her. And then as you say, you know, her power reveals itself in interesting and unexpected ways. And I, I always knew that I wanted this, this musical component to be, be through the movie. Um, so it was really through her that I discovered everything else. And, and again, like Dominique, it, it, it was great to finally have the actor there and breathe life into this character because, you know, a script is, it's just a blueprint. And then it's, it's up to the directors and it's up to the actors and the crew, everybody that's actually making the movie to breathe life into it. And, you know, that first day of on, on set and, and, and watching her be Robin, it just, it brought so much joy to me. It's like, oh, like this feels like a real human being now. And, and you know, that's great to see. Now, how did you use the setting of New Orleans itself as a character in the movie? Why New Orleans? So the, the original spec was actually Portland. And I, okay. I, wrote, for, I wrote for Portland because I, I, I knew it. I had family up there. I thought it would be, be great to see that city. And then ultimately, you know, we, we scouted Portland. We scouted a couple of other cities. And then New Orleans really just kind of screamed at us that, you know, this is the place this movie should be made. And it, it has such character and life and culture to it. And, and there was you know, this, this, this process of then rewriting for New Orleans. And rather than pretend it was another city, rather than be cagey about it, it was fully like, let's really let this be New Orleans. And, you know, I, I think that the, 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 the biggest, you know, thematic asset when we talk about the theme of power uh, for, for me was looking at it and going, okay, New Orleans uh, has been forgotten before when you look at Hurricane Katrina and what that city went through. It's a city that has experienced a lot of pain very, very recently. Uh, you know, there is, there is something so emotionally and thematically rich about not ignoring that fact, but instead using it. And then, you know, I think that all good science fiction, what it should really do is reflect back something about the real world. And so New Orleans became just, just the, the, the facts about the city became a big part of the motivation for, for Frank, for Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character and why he is the way he is and what he's doing is because you kind of extrapolate, okay, this is a character that was born and raised there. This is a character that really lives and breathes New Orleans. You know, he's got the Saints jersey on through the movie. It's like, it, it, it really helped inform why some of the characters are doing what they're doing. And I have to end uh, this interview because, you know, this, this movie, Project Power, is your own intellectual property. But you are about to embark on three different comic-based TV and film adaptations. Yeah. One of which is co-writing uh, along with Matt Reeves for The Batman. And our yeah. readers <laughs> would kill me if I didn't ask you what aspects of Bruce Wayne and his alter ego you're planning on exploring that, that differentiate it from the many properties in that uh, Batman story. Sure. I mean, it, it's it's tough to talk about just because you you want the movie to to speak for itself. <laughs> it's the early days, so I'll, I'll I'll try to to give you something without getting in trouble. You know, I <laughs> I think that first of all, you know, it it's it's a younger version than the the most recent versions that we've seen, and I think that um, you know Matt Reeves as a filmmaker, if you look at at any of his work, whether or not it's it's Let Me In or Cloverfield or the Apes movies, he's always coming from a point of emotion. You know, it's, it's, it's never, you know, the big, the big action thing. It's, it's always, you know, what is this character's soul? And I think that really looking at Batman as somebody who has gone through this trauma and then everything that he's doing is then a reaction 
to that rather than than shy away from that i think this film leans into that in some very fun and surprising ways i think that's all i can say without getting yelled at by <laughs> perfect cool. all right well matt and i want to thank you for talking to us about project power it drops on netflix on august 14th so be sure to tune in it's a lot of fun thanks Matson. thanks for having me